Spring 1940. Germany invades France and the Benelux countries. Near Rouen, hundreds of kilometers from the German or Belgian border, a local French woman sees an armored vehicle and a man in an unfamiliar uniform. Knowing they are not Frenchmen, she goes up to them and asks if they are English. To her shock, she discovers they are the command vehicle of a German panzer division. She takes off in fright, surprised since just the day before the fighting was many miles away. Who were they, she wondered. Well, if she stayed and asked, she would have gotten a reply similar to this. Bonjour, madame. I'm commander of the 7th Panzer Division, Erwin Rommel, the future Desert Fox. May 1940. Germany invades France with 10 Panzer Divisions. One of these divisions was the 7th Panzer Division, and it was commanded by General Major Erwin Rommel. The 7th Panzer before the invasion of France was a relatively new division formed after the invasion of Poland, but during the Battle of France it would get a new name, the Ghost Division. First, let's take a look at the division's commander. During the invasion of Poland, Rommel was not involved in the fighting, being part of the Führer Big Light Brigade, Hitler's personal guard. After the invasion, Rommel requested command of a Panzer Division, and Hitler himself granted it. This came as a surprise to many in German High Command, since with his experience in the Romanian and Italian Alps, it was thought to give him command of a mountain division. On February 17, 1940, he wrote to his wife, Yodel was flabbergasted at my new posting. Alfred Yodel was the Chief of Operations Staff of the German Armed Forces High Command, OKH. Now let's look at the division. During the invasion of Poland, it was originally called the 2nd Light Division with a single Panzer Battalion consisting of Panzer I and Panzer II tanks. During the Polish campaign, it fought its way to the outskirts of Warsaw before circling back to the Bzura to help stop the Polish counteroffensive. It returned to Germany and on October 18th, it became the 7th Panzer Division. Its force now consisted of 218 tanks, including some Czech models and Panzer III's and IV's. For the invasion of France, Rommel's 7th Panzer Division would be the nucleus of 15th Panzer Corps, which was part of the 4th Army. It and the 5th Panzer Division were the only Panzer Divisions in the entire army, which was one of three in Army Group A. This was to be the Schwerpunkt for the invasion, all while Army Group B would attack through Belgium and the Netherlands in a feint. When Falgel began, Rommel's immediate goal was to push through the Belgian border defenses and the dense Ardennes. But their main objective was the mighty Meuse River, which was vital to the whole German strategy. From the onset, Rommel pushed his division hard, making for Dinan. Belgian opposition was initially light since much of the Belgian army was further north to defend the major cities. There, the Belgians would be joined by the BEF and some of France's best units, and together would defend from the French frontier to Antwerp, but not the Ardennes. In the Ardennes, the Belgians conducted extensive demolitions, but few of the obstacles were covered by defensive fire. This gave German engineers little trouble clearing the obstacles, and where they couldn't be removed, they were simply bypassed. The 7th Panzer encountered their first serious opposition in the early hours of May 11th at Chabrez. There, a company of Chasseurs Ardennes held off the Germans for hours before being forced to surrender. Rommel would be so impressed by their bravery that he would comment, They are not men, they are green wolves. After overcoming the Belgians, the 7th Panzer raced towards the Orth River and crossed it at three points, Beth, Marcou, and La Roche. After crossing the Orth, French troops were encountered for the first time at Marche. These were elements of the 4th Armored Car Regiment of the 4th DLC, Division Léger de Cavalerie. These were under command of André Korap, who spent much of his career in North Africa. Korap's cavalry division was supposed to delay the Germans for five days, but when the French infantry failed to materialize, they were ordered to withdraw after less than three. Still, Rommel's men kept advancing and with minimal rest. In fact, he advanced so far so fast that he outpaced his neighboring units, the 23rd Infantry Division to the south and the 5th Panzer Division to the north. The next goal for Rommel and the entire German army was to cross the mighty Meuse River. Thanks to Rommel, the 7th Panzer not only smashed through the French defenses at Dinan, but they reached the river by the afternoon of the 12th. It was critical to capture an intact bridge, but contrary to popular belief, the French blew the bridges over the river, so crossing the Meuse was going to be difficult to say the least. So far, Rommel enjoyed the blessings of his superior, German General Hermann Hoth, who supported aggressive tank spearheads. But Ewald von Kleist, who commanded the whole Panzer Corps, opted for his units to rest for the night. They would attack in the afternoon the next day when they acquired enough air support. Rommel arrived at the Meuse in an armored car and examined the far bank with field glasses and seeing it was well defended, declared it a job for the infantry. His motorized infantry moved up and were firmly in control of the east bank of the Meuse between Dinant and Hu by the time the sun set on the 12th. He thought air support would be modest at best and planned to rest just for a brief period of time before attacking. 
At first light, he launched his attack on the western bank of the Meuse, which was defended by two French infantry divisions. However, they had only just arrived after marching for two straight nights and were exhausted. The French resisted fiercely, trying to prevent the Germans from crossing the river, but the hasty attack prevented them from putting together enough force to stop them. Soldiers from Rommel's 7th Motorized Infantry Regiment began to cross the Meuse at Dinan, and infantry from his 6th Regiment began to cross between Lev and Hou. It was at Hou, in fact, rather than at Sedan, that German units first crossed the Meuse at roughly 11.30 in the evening on May the 12th. A motorcycle battalion leaving their bikes behind crossed under cover of darkness, utilizing an old dam connecting a small island to both sides of the riverbank. There is some dispute over whether it was the motorcycle battalion of the 7th or 5th Panzer Division. The matter is further confused by the fact that Corps Commander General Hermann Holt had temporarily transferred control of elements of the 5th Panzer Division to Rommel, who was making faster progress. Either way, the Germans were very lucky because the dam had not been blown by either the French or the Belgians in fear that it would lower the river and actually make it fordable in some places. But it also should have never been left unguarded as it was. The island at Hou lay right at the boundary of two French corps and for a single fatal moment, no one was sure who was responsible for its defense. The water crossing on the morning of the 13th was made largely by inflated rubber boats. French machine gun and artillery fire was intense and it took a heavy toll. Seeing that the crossing was opposed by heavy fire and lacking a smoke unit, Rommel ordered houses in the Meuse Valley to be set on fire to supply the smoke we lacked. Rommel then saw that while a company-sized bridgehead had been formed on the opposite bank, the crossing equipment had been destroyed by enemy fire and things had come to a halt. German tanks and artillery finally began arriving and were used to silence enemy fire up and down the point of crossing. This allowed additional troops to cross and the wounded on the opposite bank to be retrieved. Rommel then personally took command of the 2nd Battalion of the 7th Regiment, leading it across the river and linking it up with units already on the opposite bank. French tanks approached and Rommel ordered small arms fire poured onto the enemy armor and this convinced the French to withdraw. On the morning of the 14th, the advance guard of the 7th Motorized Infantry Regiment, which was part of the 7th Panzer Division, reached Onay, two miles west of Denan. The commander of it, Colonel Georg von Bismarck, announced over the radio that he arrived there, but the word for arrive, eingetroffen, was misunderstood for the word eingeschlossen, which meant encircled or locked in. Radio communication then failed, setting off a crisis that rippled all the way up the chain of command. Gunther von Kluge, the army commander, spoke of an One crisis and diverted units to its direction. Rommel immediately organized all the tanks then available on the west bank of the Meuse to rush to von Bismarck's aid. The attack was led by Colonel Karl Ruthenberg, commander of the 25th Panzer Regiment, with Rommel following close behind in a Panzer III. So close that Rommel's tank came under fire from French guns, suffering two hits. Attempting to escape, the tank slid down a steep embankment where it became immobilized. Rommel bailed out with the crew and escaped with only a gash on his chin. It was a close call and it would not be the last time Rommel's life would be in danger. An attack launched that evening re-established contact with von Bismarck, ending the so-called crisis for the Germans, at least for Rommel's sector. For the French army, the crisis was only beginning. During the 13th and the 14th, all three German Panzer Corps formed bridgeheads on the western side of the Meuse. Though Georg Hans Reinhardt at Maltermé was encountering stiff resistance, while Heinz Guderian's at Sedan was only marginally better. It was at this fateful moment on the 15th of May that Korab ordered a withdrawal of his 9th army west to a new line. It also didn't help that at Sedan, French General Charles Hudziger pulled back his units when they were doing their job of holding off Guderian's spearhead. This allowed both Reinhardt and Guderian to pour out of their bridgeheads through and around the slow reacting French units and into open country. The French line now had a breach 60 miles wide with nothing to plug the gap. Opposite Holt's 15th Corps, Korab's new line lay 15 miles west of where Rommel's division had breached the Meuse. Before the new line could be occupied, however, it was penetrated by the 25th Panzer Regiment. Rommel's panzers, now with Luftwaffe support, were striking deep into the rear of the French 9th Army and prevented any counterattack toward Denan by the newly arrived French armored unit, the 1st DCR. That's Division Caresse Rapide. The French 1st DCR seemed to be at a disadvantage with 150 tanks to Rommel's 218, but more than half were heavy Char B1 tanks and it outclassed anything in the German inventory. But a big disadvantage of the Char B1 and the Samoa tanks was that a single person had to load, aim, and fire the turret gun. And the 75mm howitzer was hull mounted, so in order to aim it, the whole tank had to be redirected. Meanwhile, inside a German tank, multiple crewmen could achieve a higher rate of fire. The French tanks were also big gas guzzlers and could only operate for less than 6 hours before they had to refuel. 
which took longer because the fuel tankers were delayed since many of them were civilian models and they weren't built or equipped for operating on off-road terrain. So instead of attacking Rommel's exposed right flank, they were refueling near Flavion when the Germans came upon them, and a sharp engagement ensued at close range. Contrary to popular belief, French tanks in 1940 did have impressive armor and guns, so the Germans' best bet was to shoot off the treads because the German tanks lacked the firepower to penetrate the French tanks' thick frontal armor. So the German panzers maneuvered around them and hit the heavier French tanks in their more vulnerable flanks and rear. By the end of the day, only one third of the French tanks in the first DCR were operational. And by the 16th, only 17 were operational. During the same time period, the 7th Panzer Division completed the destruction of the French 4th North African Division, which had been plugged in into the line at Onay. Reaching the French frontier just west of Sivry, Rommel now was faced with attacking the Maginot Line extension. The Germans did not make a distinction between the true Maginot Line which ended at Longuyon and its northern extension which was made up of interlocking concrete bunkers with armored cupolas, tank ditches, and other obstacles. On the morning of the 16th, Hermann Hoth issued a halt order because even though this wasn't the main Maginot Line, the defenses were still impressive. And Hoth ordered them not to risk the tanks and leave the fortifications to be handled by the infantry. By late afternoon though, he gave the cautious order to probe the defenses, but he soon clarified that no breakthrough should be attempted, but Rommel was long gone by then. At first glance, it seemed impossible to break through without heavy artillery and air support, but as the sun was setting, Rommel decided to do something unprecedented in military history at that point, an armored night attack directly against the fortifications. This was near suicidal, but it was also the last thing the French fortress divisions would anticipate. They were trained for more static warfare and not a war of movement like the Vagenskrieg, especially with Rommel as their adversary. The first tanks of Rommel's armored wedge smashed through the first defenses before the French could even react, but resistance was fierce. Vehicles were knocked out left and right by anti-tank and artillery guns firing from the bunkers. Nevertheless, enough German tanks got within the perimeter to silence the forward bunkers with direct hits. In that lull, the combat engineers moved into action with satchel charges and flamethrowers against the fieldworks. Firing on the move at all sides, the panzers pushed forward, quickly followed by the motorcycle companies. They raced towards the French artillery, never stopping, and the French defenses were successfully pierced as the sun set, and the panzers found themselves in open country by early evening. At the head of the division, riding in a command tank, Rommel now drove the vanguard of the 7th Panzer relentlessly. Instead of stopping, Rommel drove his armored spearheads onward, speeding at night over the French roads towards the city of Aven. Unable to reach Hoth on the radio, Rommel refused to stop. On his own initiative, he ordered the panzers to push west, wreaking havoc in the French rear, crashing right into the French 5th Motorized Infantry Division, which had parked its tanks and vehicles on the roadside before resting. Now they awoke to the sound of tanks and the fire of heavy guns. Paralyzed, the surviving Frenchmen threw down their weapons and scattered in all directions. All along the road to Aven, the French were caught by surprise, and the night was illuminated by burning tanks and trucks. By the time they reached Aven, the first DCR had only three tanks left. By sunrise on the morning of the 17th, Rommel's forces were now eight miles west of Landrecies, on a hill just east of the village of Les Chateaux, exhausted and nearly out of fuel and ammunition. Two panzer battalions were now 50 kilometers farther west than they had been the day before. According to author Alistair Horn, it was the most spectacular German exploit of the day, possibly of the whole campaign, and one which more than any other was to establish Rommel's reputation. Now, morning of May 17th, as Rommel was on the river Sambre, a new problem arose. Only a small portion of his spearhead was with him, the rest was now far behind, dangerously so in the minds of some. One staff officer later wrote a memorandum submitted to both Rommel and Hoth complaining that a divisional commander ought to remain to the rear at or close to his headquarters. But when the situation became a bit precarious, Rommel would improvise solutions. So the Maginot Line was broken, but on such a narrow front, it was more like a tongue protruding into enemy territory. Much of the main body of the German armed forces was still at the Maginot Line and on Belgian territory. In fact, many in German high command thought it was a trap set by the French to lure them in. So Rommel put his small force in a hedgehog defense on the bridge at Les Chateaux, leaving them isolated in the middle of enemy territory. With just a single tank, Rommel raced back in the direction he came from to link back up with his division. As Rommel was heading back alone, he encountered large swaths of confused French soldiers who were shocked to see a German tank coming at them from the other direction. Rommel ordered the tank not to stop, so he kept going until he ran into a convoy of 40 trucks which was guarded with machine guns. 
He drove past it, stopped the lead truck, then ordered the French to leave their trucks and disperse with just a single tank to back him up. The French could have easily overwhelmed him, but they didn't even attempt to. Instead, without halting, Hunkett led the lorry convoy onto a parking place and there disarmed the enemy troops. We now found that we had no less than 40 lorries, many of them carrying troops behind us. After this, Rommel continued back to link up with his division, then raced back to Rothenburg's position, but not before engaging with French tanks that took up a blocking position between Landrecies and Le Chateau. But while Rommel was driving back and forth, Rothenburg was fending off French tank attacks, all without being resupplied. Rommel was surprised to learn that for some unknown reason, a supply column had not made it through, so he dispatched units back again to ensure that the supplies would get through. That took until 3pm, according to Rommel's records. Then, shortly after midnight on the 18th, he was given orders to take Cambrai, 15 miles west of Le Chateau. But the 25th Panzer Regiment, which was to be used for the attack, was not ready. So a Kampfgruppe, called Battalion Paris, formed mostly of motorized infantry, a few tanks, and two propelled flat guns, was dispatched to take Cambrai. At Cambrai, the battalion advanced over a broad front and in great depth, straight across the fields to the northwest, throwing up a great cloud of dust as they went. Tanks and AA guns scattered fire at intervals in the northern outskirts of Cambrai. The enemy in Cambrai, unable in the dust to see that most of our vehicles were soft-skinned, apparently thought that a large-scale tank attack was approaching the north of the town and offered no resistance. By that evening, the town of Cambrai, the scene of heavy fighting in World War I, was captured. The 19th was spent regrouping and allowing the exhausted Panzer crews to get some rest. Rommel then met with Hoth, demanding that he be allowed to make another night attack to seize the high ground south of Arras. Hoth thought the troops needed more rest, but was persuaded by Rommel's reasoning that a successful night attack would mean fewer casualties, and fewer casualties is always good. In the early morning darkness of May 20th, the Panzers were again on the move with Rommel in the lead. They reached a village 2.5 miles south of Arras at about 5am. As during the breakthrough at the Maginot Line and the raid to Aven, the motorized infantry regiments did not maintain contact with the Panzers, falling well behind. Rommel again retraced his steps, attempting to make contact with them, and again was nearly captured. Alistair Horn wrote, French cavalry tanks were infiltrating across his lines of communication. These knocked out Rommel's accompanying tanks, and for several hours, he and his signal staff were surrounded. The rest of the day was spent clearing up the situation and bringing up infantry and artillery. Units of the SS Totenkampf Death's Head Division were coming up on his left to cover that flank. The 5th Panzer would then come up on his right as the flank was screened with infantry and artillery. The Armored Reconnaissance Battalion was in the rear, most likely for the division's logistical tail, given the problems of the previous days. At this time, there were rumors of British and French divisions concentrating near Arras, but Rommel dismissed them and continued with his own plans. The 25th Panzer Regiment would lead the advance around Arras to the northwest, meanwhile Guderian's 2nd Panzer Division reached the English Channel at noyel sur mer creating a corridor, splitting the Allies in two. However, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill saw an opportunity. He reasoned that like a tortoise with its head sticking out of its shell, the corridor was vulnerable and he was right. With the Panzer Division so far forward, the flanks were vulnerable until the slow-moving infantry could follow up. So the Allies prepared a counterattack, but ran into problems, particularly in the High Command. Other problems included communications, coordination, and lack of air and artillery support. Nevertheless, the attack went off at Arras. It was a mostly British endeavor, but the French were also involved. And despite the handicaps, the Allied attack began very well, advancing as far as 6 miles and causing some panic amongst the Germans. This is because the British Matilda tanks proved to be semi-invulnerable to German anti-tank guns at the time. Rommel then again went to where the action was and wrote that the situation was in an extremely tight spot and new action had to be taken. With the help of his aide, Joachim Most, he rallied the gun crews and brought every available gun into action. With Most's help, I brought every available gun into action at top speed against the tanks. Every gun, both anti-tank and anti-aircraft, was ordered to open rapid fire immediately, and I personally gave each gun its target. With the enemy tanks so perilously close, only rapid fire from every gun could save the situation. The key weapon in repulsing the Allied attack was the 88mm, with one battery claiming to have destroyed 9 British tanks. On the night of the 23rd, Allied troops pulled back from the Arras salient. Following the engagement at Arras, Rommel continued north towards Lille, but the hard fighting was not over. Trying to cross La Bassi Canal on May 26, Rommel wrote that strong enemy resistance prevented the creation of a bridgehead, and they had to eliminate a number of machine gun nests before two battalions could establish themselves on the northern bank. 
so the French were still fighting and fighting hard. The next few days, Rommel helped establish defensive positions outside Lille, fending off Allied attacks before being relieved by German infantry. According to the Rommel papers, a big source of quotes for this video, there was some pretty heavy fighting. Even saying that, the situation was extremely critical at one point with him having to drive sappers to build pontoons to get tanks across the canal which had sunken barges in it. Lille fell by June 1st and Rommel was summoned to meet Hitler on June 2nd where he was awarded the Knight's Cross. The Fuhrer's visit was wonderful. He greeted me with the words, Rommel, we were very worried about you during the attack. His whole face was radiant, and I had to accompany him afterwards. I was the only division commander who did. June 5th, Germany begins Falrot, Case Red, Phase 2 of their invasion of France. During the battle and evacuation of Dunkirk, the French used the time to build a new defense dubbed the Vagon Line, named after the new commander of the French army, General Maxime Vagon. It was not a defense in depth, and despite how weak the French army was, having lost large quantities of men and armor, it seemed to do the job at holding off the Germans initially. Except for Rommel, who powered through it, taking Le Quesnoy. At 1600 hours sharp, the tanks moved to the attack. The various arms worked in such perfect coordination that it might have been a peacetime exercise. The French colonial troops opposing us, who were dug in in the small woods on the southern slopes of the hills 116 and 104, with large numbers of field and anti-tank guns, defended themselves desperately. The next day, he drove another 50 kilometers and by the 7th reached Elbeuf on the River Seine. He apparently advanced so far so fast that at one point he had to stop because he was in danger of being bombed by the Luftwaffe if he went any further. On the 8th, he took Rouen, but the bridges there were destroyed. Still, by June 9th, the 7th Panzer Division along with the 5th and 2nd Panzer Divisions cut and surrounded the French 9th Corps off from Le Havre where they hoped to be evacuated in Operation Cycle. On the morning of the 12th at saint valery en coup French General Marcel Hélère gave the order to surrender despite the protests of the British 51st Highland Division. He wrote this to his wife that day. Dearest Lou, the battle is over here. Today one corps commander and four division commanders presented themselves before me in the market square of saint valery having been forced by my division to surrender. Wonderful moments. On June 17th, the division was ordered to take Cherbourg. They advanced 240 kilometers in just one day and after two days of shelling, the French garrison surrendered on the 19th. Rommel was only stopped by the armistice which the French signed on June 22nd and took effect on the 25th. At last, the armistice is in force. We're now less than 200 miles from the Spanish frontier and hope to go straight on there so as to get the whole Atlantic coast in our hands. How wonderful it's all been. Something I ate yesterday upset me, but I'm better again already. Billet's middling. For the costs of less than 2,500 casualties and 42 tanks destroyed, Rommel's division had captured 97,648 Allied soldiers, 277 field guns, 64 anti-tank guns, 458 tanks and armored cars, and more than 4,000 trucks in addition to enormous amounts of supplies. Following the armistice, the division was first sent to the Somme, then to Bordeaux to prepare for the planned invasion of Britain. This invasion was later cancelled as Germany was not able to acquire the air superiority deemed a necessity for a successful outcome. In February, the division was placed in reserve and returned to Germany. The unit was stationed near Bonn while preparations were being made for Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union, until June 8, 1941. The division was loaded onto 64 trains and transported by rail to the east. Rommel's success in 1940 stunned both the Allies and the Germans. During the campaign, the French gave the 7th Panzer the nickname La Division Fantôme, the Phantom Division. The Germans called it Gespenster Division, Ghost Division, and is still remembered by that name. Because of his daring exploits, Rommel was the prime candidate to command the Deutsches Afrika Corps. He was promoted to General Leutnant by February 1941 and sent to Tripoli to help the Italians after their disastrous defeat in Operation Compass. He would fight in numerous battles in Libya, Egypt, Tunisia, then once again in France before being forced to commit suicide to protect his family in October of 1944. If you want to learn about another great operational success, check out my video on Operation Compass, the Allies' first North African offensive of World War II. Thank you for watching, like, comment, and hit subscribe.